Next up, Amy Lee Bredlow, who, as Jackie said, recently joined her. Um, she is Director of Neuro-Oncology at uh, South Carolina um, uh, uh, Children's Cancer Center, and is going to talk to us on an HDAC inhibitor proposal. Get your slideshow going. Great. Well, I appreciate the promotion, but I'm the Director of Pediatric Neuro-Oncology oh. only. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but thank you. Um, and so I just want to start out by thanking everybody for allowing me to be here today and talk. And um, I am a new member of NMTRC. Uh, this is my second time here, and so I really appreciate you guys being willing to listen to me. And I appreciate the support that I've gotten from all of you so far. Um, so actually, I think that Jackie's talk, and this was not intentional, we did not plan this, um, though we could have, I suppose, but this is a great segue into really what I'm um, thinking about. And so I'm going to ask you all to kind of change, just shift your mentality and your mindset just for a couple of moments, because I am not talking about a drug that I am developing in my lab. I'm talking about um, a, a different way of looking at the advancement in in therapies and selections. Um, so this is a proposal about a selection study, actually. And um, before we get into the real slides, I'll just explain to you my perspective and my background and why I think that this is important for us to talk about. Um, my background is as a drug development um, focus, and I'm completely clinical. I don't have a lab, and I haven't worked in a lab since medical school, which was a lot more years ago than you would guess. Um, <laughs> so. What I find is that frequently, uh, once a, an idea like the ones we've talked about so far today, which are all fabulous ideas, are they get across that hurdle um, that we were just discussing, the, the proof of concept hurdle, then you'll find that there are a number of pharmaceutical companies and then they all come out with their own Me Too drug. And we've all seen that, right? I mean, we were talking about NSAIDs earlier. How many NSAIDs are there on the market? There are a lot of Me Too drugs. And it's obvious why that happens. But the question that I ask as somebody who develops drugs um, if for, for clinical use in people, not, not for, from the development standpoint in a laboratory. I, I don't have that kind of brain power, so I just don't even try. But um, what I like to look at is, so why did this one win? Why is this one the one that we're using? Why are we using, for example, topotecan? Why are we using that and not arinotecan? Is it because it's biologically better? Is it because it clinically works better? Or is it because it was better marketed? And these are the concerns that I have, and that's what I want to talk with you guys about today. So, ooh, not working. Okay. Um, So I want to talk to you about a, a concept that I believe works, and there's some proof to support this, um, in histone deacetylase inhibitors. So histone deacetylase is an enzyme that we normally have, and normally what it does is it removes the acetyl group from the lysine amino acid of the histones. What that means for those of you who didn't go to medical school and really are not following a lot of the lab science is your DNA is supposed to be coiled around a protein called a histone. When it's coiled appropriately, it's, it allows your cell to regulate replication and transcription, so cell growth and cell activity, appropriately. Um, and for those of you who are biochemists, please forgive me for my gross oversimplification, but this is how I think of it. Um, in some tumors, this is dysregulated or deregulated, and the reason for that I don't understand, but what I do understand is when there is dysregulation of the histone deacetylase, Com compound, when the histones are not, wound, are, are not winding the DNA appropriately, problems happen. Cancer is one of the problems that happens. It's not the only problem. They think that histone deacetylase um, dysregulation can be problematic in arthritis and autoimmune problems and other issues as well. So it's not unique to cancer, but it is something that we know happens with cancer. Um, normally, the way the histone winds the DNA limits how much replication of the cancer, of the cell there is, too much replication can lead to cancer. So that's the basic theory and background. So the reason that histone deacetylase inhibition has been promoted is because there's the belief and the opinion that if you can regulate that for a dysregulated cell, maybe you can actually treat cancer. Um, that 
puts the acetyl group on the lysine and then it has the histone bind the DNA more appropriately, allows access for appropriate gene expression. Not too much, not too little, but back to where it's supposed to be. Um, it also happens to repress NF-kappa B signaling. This is another pathway. I was talking with Patrick and a few other people this morning about um, all of the different pathways, and we don't really know all the time exactly how the pathways intertwine and interact. But one of the things that we do know is the histone deacetylases do interact with the NF-kappa B signaling. We know that NF-kappa B signal signaling dysregulation is also related to cancer. So this is a shared pathway, and that can be useful. And then uh, p53 expression is well known uh, if it's upregulated to lead to cancer syndromes in families and cancers in individuals as well. Um, sorry, if it's downregulated, I apologize. That was a bad mis opportunity to misspeak. But anyway, HDAC inhibition also upregulates p53 expression. So the bottom line is that if you use HDAC inhibition, you're regulating the cell. Uh, back to its normal regulation of protein uh, express, gene expression. Um, there is some data to support this theory. It's almost all in adults, I apologize, but that is the way it works in my world, which is really frustrating. Uh, but it has been shown to be useful in solid tumors, including breast cell, um, actually liquid tumors as, tell, as well. Um, multiple myeloma and T-cell lymphoma. I didn't go through, I didn't list for you every single tumor that HDAC inhibition has been shown to work in. Um, it's also been shown to work in high-grade glioma. Um, that's my personal nemesis, being the brain tumor person around here. It's the tumor that drives me crazy. Um, it's also been shown to work in ovarian tumors. And like I said, I didn't actually present every single um, tumor that HDAC inhibitors work in. However, this is a list of HDAC inhibitors. There are a lot of them. And so the question is, again, we go back to why is one selected and does it work better than the rest of them? Um, I, I kind of did group them out for you. So there are six different well-known, well-researched HDAC inhibitors. Um, class one, class two, class three, you get it, it continues on. Um, so class one inhibitors are pretty popular and novel. Um, the ramidepsin is in use in humans. MS-275, I think, is not yet accessible. Uh, valproic acid is actually an anti-epileptic agent, and that's actually what got me interested in HDAC inhibition in the very beginning, um, because I'm a brain tumor doctor. When people have brain tumors that are resected, frequently they have seizures that present the, as they're presenting symptom, they'll have a seizure and somebody scans their head and finds a tumor. Um, sometimes they've not had a seizure and the tumor's been presented, uh, presented in a different way, but regardless, they may still be put on an anti-seizure medication like valproic acid. They may not, uh, but frequently in adults they are. And they actually found a study where they randomized people to different kinds of anti-seizure medications and found that people with high-grade glioma survived longer, this was in adults of course, but they survived longer if they were on valproic acid than if they were on a different seizure medication. So this says that that's not about whether they're having fatal seizures, which can happen, but it's not about that. It's not about whether they're seizing or not. Somehow the valproic acid worked differently and had a different pathway, and this is what we call an off-target effect. So the valproic acid was being given initially to prevent seizures, but the off-target effect was it was functioning as a histone deacetylase inhibitor and actually prolonging survival of people with high-grade gliomas. Um, are off-target effects good? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. For valproic acid, this off-target effect is a good thing. Um, phenylbutyrate is another one that's out there. It has the same function. Um, both valproic acid and phenylbutyrate have been around for a really long time, so they're not so expensive. So my question here, when we're looking at these comparisons, is Varinostat you see down here at the bottom is really, really popular. It's been studied a number of times in adults and children for a number of different kinds of cancers, but it costs like $20,000 a month. Valproic acid costs like $300 a month. Which one's better? I don't know. I just know which one's more expensive. I know which one is easy to take. I know which one I have decades of experience with and, and uh, a lot of toxicology information on, but I also know which one is marketed well. Um, and so this is where my question comes from, and here's the proposal that kind of came from that 
What I'd like to do is look at these histone deacetylase inhibitors, not all of them because that list is really, really long, but a, a select number of them from these different categories, like class one inhibitors, class one and two inhibitors, the PAN inhibitors, and see which mechanism, which one of these works better. So that's what a selection study is. Um, when I took biostatistics, which I'm absolutely horrible at, but one of the concepts that I learned was there's a selection study called Pick the Winner, and it's a randomized clinical trial. You give X number of drugs. In this case, my proposal is for four arms because I think that's a reasonable number to do in a randomized fashion. And you just say, which one works best? If, it, if, the, if the tumors are shrinking, if people are being well controlled, which one is best? And that's the one you go with from that point forward. You can also, you can put in another layer of which one is best and less socially um, onerous, which would be which one doesn't cost $20,000 a month if you can get around it. Um, that is all other things being equal. If they all decrease the tumor size, prolong survival in the same way, then you, the winner at that point is the one that is affordable. Um, my proposal is that we do this in all solid tumors that are progressive or uh, recurrent. The reason for that is because HDAC inhibitors, as I showed you before, have been shown to be productive and, and useful in a number of solid tumors, so I wouldn't want to eliminate any patient population um, from that first look. And then I'm proposing about 12 subjects per arm. Here are my ideas based on the description I showed you before, just looking at different categories and different specific function of the HDAC inhibitors. So varinostat, which is very popular and people like it a lot, so that means that we do have some toxicology data and some safety data in children. Valproic acid, for the reasons I described, the ramidepsin and the atenostat are, diff are in different categories as well. Phenylbutyrate I listed as a possibility, but that is because it's affordable and practical, but that's in the same category as valproic acid, so it's not really my favorite idea, but it's a thought. Um, and then clearly I think that these do need to be in combination. We've been talking a lot about that. Um, I think if this study is something that people are interested in investigating more and developing, then we can have a really candid debate about what backbone would be most appropriate. I have ideas, but I'm not certain that my ideas are the only ones that are valid. And that's it. Questions? <laughs>